The following podcast is a member of the Pokecasters Network. Pokecasters Network, supporting Pokemon content creators, their shows, and the community of Pokemon fans. To find out more, check out pokecastersnetwork.com or find us on Twitter and Facebook. Hello, and welcome to Lucas Lectures, hosted by the big fish himself, veteran Lucas. Sit back, relax, and enjoy today's topic. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Lucas Lectured. It's me, Veteran Lucas, on the Pokey Science Podcast. Hopefully, you guys have noticed the name change and the sick logo. The reason we finally decided to change our logo and switching from Pokey Science to the Science of Pokemon is that Nintendo has been very nintendo E lately, and we want to make sure that we cover our butts because the word Pokemon can be flagged. So, by saying Pokey Science and making a mildly ambiguous logo that Quite frankly, it looks way better than our old one, even though I loved our old one to death. We can stay in the clear and hopefully keep doing more stuff like this for as long as possible. Anywho, on today's episode, we are going to be focusing on fossils. Uh, there have been a lot of stories recently in the news about really cool fossil findings. And as you say that, you start hearing the sound off in the distance. You start hearing the the rising overture of the Jurassic Park theme as it slowly builds and fills your heart with nostalgia and hope that maybe, just maybe, we can bring them back and see them in real life. (sighs) Well, stop. That's what this episode's about. We are going to be talking about two real-world attempts to bring back fossils, why they are either doomed to the fail or they are so ridiculously convoluted there's no point in even doing them. And then we're going to top it all off with putting those real-world limitations onto our fossil Pokemon to see how that would pan out in terms of getting the fossil Pokemon to actually come back to life. So without further ado, uh, let's get started with a man by the name of Jack Horner. Now, Jack Horner was the lead paleontologist behind the Jurassic Park films. And honestly, that's what he's famous for. Uh, If you look into his paleontology career, um, if you ask experts, he's not exactly liked. He's not deemed as a good scientist. He's just famous for being that guy who got the velociraptors wrong. But he is currently working on a project. uh, People have nicknamed it uh, Chickenosaurus. Uh, The idea is that you take a chicken which is a really close living relative of the archaeosaurs that were the dinosaurs, then you're going to modify the embryo as it develops and give it some of its dinosaur-like features by cracking into the genome. So the idea is to fake it, to make a living organism look like a dinosaur and raise that. So it's a very extreme version of selective breeding and genetic tinkering to try and get dinosaur-like creatures to be born. Now, there is a number of ethical, financial, and let's just face it, creepy barriers that get past this. But that is one of the ways people are trying to bring dinosaurs back. It's not by directly taking the DNA from ancient organisms, but by just trying to make something look like a dinosaur. If you're going to do that, head down to your local party supply store, go buy a dog costume that looks like a dragon, and throw it on your dog, and that's a lot cheaper, and you'll get an equally adorable effect. Actually, more adorable, because I do not want to see a half dinosaur, half chicken. That sounds horrible. But would it taste good? Nope, nope, we're just going to move past it. The next one has a lot more promise, but this one also has its barriers and limitations. So there is a project that is taking place to try and bring mammoths back to life. In order to do this, um, they actually found a mammoth that was in super well-preserved condition. They found it frozen in a block of ice. And the fur, soft tissue, um, all of it was still there. So you could actually see what this mammoth looked like when it died. It's, it's like a time capsule. It's so cool to just look up this frozen cube of a mammoth. Uh, but the problem is, uh, people will see it and they think, oh my gosh, we have all this material. We can totally find some DNA to try and bring this thing back to life. So slow your roll right there. Even if you find DNA, there's a really good chance it's probably been deteriorated or degraded in some way. Even the Jurassic Park movies point that out. But in the movies, they slap together some frog DNA to try and patch it up together. Um, In our world, you would probably have to patch it up with 
their closest living relative. And the closest living relative we know of to the mammoth is the eastern elephant. So the ones that live out in India with the smaller ears. These would be the closest living relatives we have. So we would have to try and patch up what DNA we found with that elephant. Now also keep in mind, there's a really good chance that that DNA is degraded beyond the point of use. Because DNA, in order to really help it stay intact, needs two major conditions. A cool place and a dry place. Now, I think being frozen to a block of ice covers one of those. But if it gets too damp, if it gets too, I know people hate this word, moist, then it's going to have it that the DNA is not going to be viable. Uh, People are already seeing that every time you bring it up about bringing up DNA. Like, oh, we found some. Yeah, but we didn't find enough to actually work with. Uh, The other problem is... Where are you going to incubate it? Where are you, If you were to, say, get the DNA, get a perfect cell all set and ready to go, and then you are able to get it to go through mitosis and meiosis and create a living organism, where are you going to grow it in? Despite what people think, we can't just grow life in a tube. Um, we need a surrogate mother. You need a womb to put it in. Thus, the Asian elephant that just gave her DNA is also going to probably have to be the womb for this half mammoth, half Indian elephant. And that's important to know because you're not going to be breeding a mammoth if you're already splicing in DNA from other animals. You're making a hybrid. If you wanted to make a hybrid, this is how you do it, but you're never going to get a pure mammoth. Uh, And that can be a problem once the baby is born. First off, the baby has no guarantee of success in the pregnancy. Uh, Second, if it is born, there's no guarantee that its mom will care for it. Because if it comes out and it looks weird, the elephant will cut its losses and try and make a new baby. That's harsh and sad, but that's the reality of working with animals. And third, even if it is taken by the mother, even if it is able to pass and survive into adulthood, would it really be a mammoth? Because it's going to have been raised by Asian elephants. So you're going to have this weird, like, patchy-haired Asian elephant lumbering around just being an Asian elephant, you just spent millions and millions of dollars and decades of research to make a really weird hybrid. Uh, The same is true for just about every single DNA story you find. Anytime someone says, we found the DNA, we can bring it back to life, stop trying to make Jurassic Park a thing. It's never going to be a thing. And this is coming from someone who loves that movie who loves the idea of seeing these things in real life. But I think the argument should be made that all that time, money, and resources could go to saving animals from extinction to begin with. If I was going to play devil as advocate on this one, uh, there have been those who have been trying to take recently extinct animals, like a Tasmanian tiger that was preserved in formaldehyde, and seeing if they can recreate that organism to try and put it back out in the wild, because we were the ones who drove it to extinction and not a meteor or a receding ice age. There's a really good argument to be made about bringing those animals back. But again, the scientific limitations are there, and just the DNA limitations are there. We cannot currently create these organisms and honestly i don't even think we should now let's take those real world limitations and quantify them so in order we need to have workable dna uh we need an incubator we're going to need to be able to take care of it diet and habitat that sort of deal and we're also going to have to sometimes worry about social structure and their territory and what they need in terms of an overall living space so how do you think that would play out in pokemon Uh, The good news is we can already cross one of these off the list. Thanks to Mewtwo on Cinnabar Island, we know that the Pokemon world has the technology to take a single cell and turn it into a living organism. No problem. Okay, admittedly there was problem because all the dittos running around were failed experiments, but the fact that they can create life in a tube takes one of these things off the list. So it's actually easier to make a fossil Pokemon come to life than it is to make a fossil dinosaur in our world come to life. Points for Pokemon. Now, some people might think, okay, why don't we use the Ditto for help? Because the Dittos can copy DNA and they can try and look a little bit like it or behave a little bit like it. The problem is, if the Ditto can only copy what's available, it can't fill in the blanks. It would just be copying the faulty DNA. It probably wouldn't work out that well. And again, you're still getting a weird hybrid. So here's a, a small list I made of some of the fossil types that I thought would be a bit interesting to work with. <laughs> Number one... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, it, it's funny to me because it's Kabuto. And in the old days, Kabuto was seen as just like this 400 
million year old Pokemon that people found and they brought it back to life and it scuttles around. But according to the Sword and Shield decks, um, it says that Kabuto is almost extinct. So that means that all that time, energy, and resources to bring back a fossil was wasted because they just live somewhere else anyway and Kanto didn't know about it. Now, this can happen in the scientific community. You could think, oh my gosh, this animal is extinct. We have to try and get it back. And then someone just shows up like, hey, look what I caught off my boat. It's this ancient fish you all thought was dead. That's the story of the coelacanth. But it's really cool that in Pokemon, that even an animal you're trying to bring back, it just happens to be alive. It's just one you didn't know existed due to the limitations of technology, communication, or geography. Now, let's say that they were just all extinct. They were gone, gone, gone. DNA degrades real, real easy, and even in the best conditions, it can only survive somewhere in the 50,000 to 100,000 years range completely intact. There are definitely examples of it lasting longer, but in order to get the right amount we need, it definitely needs to be in the tens of thousands of years versus hundred thousands to millions. You'd be lucky to find a scrap of DNA from something that old. Now, if you were, and you needed to patch it up, uh, you would need to have some sort of surrogate to patch up those parts. We can't just Jurassic Park this and throw frog on it, so you're going to have to find the closest living relative. Now, just based on egg group, my guess would actually be wimp pod. I think wimp pod would be a great surrogate. You'd get a weird kabutops uh, glossopod hybrid by the end of it, which I think would look rad. Now, I know people are screaming, why not use Scyther? Because Scyther has those scissor-like hands just like Kabutops does. But aside from the hands, they don't really have anything in common. This is more likely something called convergent evolution, where they both just accidentally developed really cool hands. You see the same with penguins and sharks, where they both have the same coloration patterns. Black on top, white on the belly. Uh, Good news is, Because they're basically scavengers, because they're based mostly on horseshoe crabs, we wouldn't have to worry about diet. And because they are based on horseshoe crabs, they don't really care about socializing. They show up on the beach, they spawn, they go and do their own thing. So if you were able to bring it back, it would just be a garbage disposal. It would just be cleaning up the bottom. So nothing too terrifying. Aerodactyl provides another problem. How do you patch something when all of its relatives are dead? So pterosaurs, despite what many people think, they're not dinosaurs. The pterosaurs were a group that lived side by side with the dinosaurs that went extinct along with them. But they have no closely related ancestors left. So Aerodactyl, if you found the fossil, great. If you found DNA that's slightly workable, awesome. But you wouldn't be able to patch it up with anything. You would never be able to get it the exact way it was or even get a hybrid out of it because you don't have anything left to try and patch it up. It's sad, but you're not going to get an Aerodactyl on your team anytime soon. Uh, If we go down to uh, a little bit later out in Gen 4, we had Shieldon. Uh, And Shieldon, um, this Pokemon was well and truly extinct. And unlike Kabutops, it was the only true rock type. That we got out of all the fossils. The only pure rock type. Now to bring him back. We would need to patch up that DNA with something with a similar build. And my money would be on Aeron. My theory is that Bastiodon. Would be a pure rock type too. But by splicing in some of that Aeron DNA. It was able to pick up the steel typing while it was at it. Because that's the only way you'd be able to patch up some of that broken. Hundreds and hundreds of million year old DNA. Now the problem is. You won't be able to get a shield on to behave the same. These are herbivorous, defensive creatures, which means that they live in groups. They are going to defend themselves by forming a barrier. Uh, It's kind of like having a one brick wall, and that's it. You can just go around the wall. These organisms would never be able to survive because they don't have friends to help block up and they don't have anyone to teach them how to protect. You just created the genetic equivalent of a one-man wave at a stadium. It's just depressing. So next up we have Tertorga, and Tertorga is really easy. All you would need to splice up that DNA is some Squirtle. A Squirtle can live in both salt and fresh water. It's in the same egg group, so that is cleared and dealt with. It is a 100 million old year old fossil, so same song and dance. The DNA probably wouldn't be viable, but let's say it was. Uh, the problem with sea turtles 
is that they have to go back to the place they were born to lay their egg. So the lab would have to be designed right on the beach with that in mind and have them hatch in that sand. If you were able to do that, you'd actually get a pretty good shot of having them adapt as long as they didn't get eaten by something. Uh, They don't socialize outside of mating, so you would need to get a few different batches going. But you could feasibly bring them back Again, with those limitations. Again, it wouldn't be a pure Pokemon because it would have some of that Squirtle in it. But that shouldn't be too much of a problem. So next we have Archeon. And Archeon, unlike Aerodactyl, is the descendant of all flying bird Pokemon. So it is the current ancestor that we got for all of the birds that we love so much. Now, the big thing for them is learning how to fly. Patching up the DNA, easy. Just throw in one of the various bird Pokemon you have, pick your favorite, and then slow that in. You'll get a weird hybrid, but you'll at least get it alive. Learning how to fly, huge problem. Have you ever seen the animation of Archeops flying? It's really, really strange because it's frantically flapping its arms as best as it can. It kind of reminds me of those really old cartoons of Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry where they get two leaves and they just start flapping them frantically as best as they can to stay afloat. That's pretty much what Archeops was. It was the first flying bird-like Pokemon. So it's just learning how to use its wings. So it's not going to be able to fly as efficiently because it has no examples to teach it how. And for a lot of birds, it's usually drop and see if you can fly or die as you hit the ground and get eaten by something. So you might have to go through a lot of money to try and get one that learns how to fly. And finally, Tyrant. Tyrant is the only complete dragon fossil. The reason I say complete is because I do not count the Galar fossils. They are not fossil Pokemon. They are a mistake upon nature and Arceus himself. The woman should have been locked in a cage and never let out again after fusing those monsters. I know Ash got one now, and it's super cool, and it's got a chunky face in the animation. You just want to squish. But those abominations, I don't count them as fossils. I barely count them as Pokemon. Anywho, uh, we would need dragon types with a similar build to a Tyrant. And its temperament. So my money is on Gibble. So Gibble is a pretty fierce little Pokemon on its own. And it does have that same snarly attitude. So I would put them together to see what we would get. But big problem you wouldn't see coming. Once you get your first Tyrant, you realize that they don't socialize too well. And that they tend to claim a wide range of area as their territory. If you let them go, if they escape... They could threaten a lot of the wild life out in the Pokemon world, especially if it evolves. And we wouldn't know that while we were getting them. It would be literally Jurassic World where we just created this hybrid T-Rex to break and destroy stuff. Honestly, I wish its shiny was white so I can make this metaphor more perfect. Stop trying to clone T-Rexes. It's literally never worked out in our favor. So, all ranting aside... All nonsensical yelling. Again, I love movies like Jurassic Park, and I love fossil Pokemon. I I kid a lot about the Galar fossil Pokemon. I do think they're an interesting thing, but again, they're so weird, and I hate that lady so much for making them. But one thing I really want people to understand is that whenever I hear people say, I wish they were back, I want to see dinosaurs in real life, I always want to remind them, look out your window, and you'll see birds in the sky, you'll see squirrels on the ground, raccoons in your garbage. There's some amazing wildlife already here. All the time and money we could be spending on keeping them alive is being spent on trying to bring back something that died without our control. They died from a meteor or an ice age going away. It wasn't our fault they passed away. Their time is done. Let the new guys take over and appreciate them for what they are. That's nothing wrong with wishing that you could see a T-Rex in real life. What I'm saying is... Appreciate the real ones that are alive today as well as the real ones that were alive in the past. Just let the ones that are living today be loved and appreciated as they are now without having to overshadow them with long dead super lizards. Now before I wrap up, I want to give a shout out to two peoples that we got on our Patreon. That is Dylan and Brian. Dylan, Brian, thank you so much for being part of our crew, helping us fund this and keep us going. Again, this means the world to us. We are a team of four who just wants to teach people and y'all make it happen. Thank you so, so much for that. And finally, 
with our new sick logo, we were also able to get a shirt company to accept some of our designs, including but not limited to our signs film Sitter War from back when we were in the league. When we had our two scoops shirt made, we also added our new logo, so you guys can get that as a shirt. And we got a new art commissioned, and it's beautiful. It's Teddy Roosevelt punching an Ursaring. No, I'm not kidding. If you want to see Teddy Roosevelt beating up an Ursaring and wearing that on a shirt or pin, you can do that now. We want you guys, if you like our show, if you want to be a part of it and help us out, but you don't want to commit to being a patron, we understand there's something for you guys, too. You can grab a shirt, and the funds go to helping to make this show work. Not to mention, look at that logo. Look at it. It's beautiful. I've been looking at it for five hours now. All right, guys, so that is all we have for today. We hope you guys have a great rest of your day and night. We have so much planned for you guys this year. I can't wait to share it all with you. But for now, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace!